Hello everyone and welcome to the VivoQuant 3.5 release webinar. My name is TJ Ligori. I'm a software account manager here at Invicro and I'm very happy to announce the release of VivoQuant 3.5. So for the call today, uh, we'll go through some brief company background of Invicro and then of course jump into 3.5 with a feature review. I have some slides to show the various tools and features that we've updated with this release and then nothing quite like a live demonstration to uh, to really show off the software. Of course I'll leave some time for questions and answers at the end uh, however the GoToWebinar also does have a question feature in the in your panel so feel free to post questions there and I'll try to answer them as they come up uh, or if not certainly as I mentioned at the end. So a brief background on Invicro. Uh, we have currently four locations and we like to say we are the imaging experts. We work across the entire drug development spectrum. Uh, we frankly are uh, agnostic to image type, modality, sample size, resolution. We don't really care. To be completely honest, as long as there's an image involved in a biological process question, we're interested in helping you find the answer. Uh, and that goes across our various locations. As I mentioned, Boston, where we're headquartered, New Haven, Connecticut, the Translational Imaging Center in Michigan, and uh, our presence in London. As many of you may already know, we have a really a two-tiered system or uh, offering at Invicro, that being software and services. On the services side, we offer uh, imaging expertise in preclinical discovery, uh, translational research, and then our clinical core lab, uh, which as I mentioned, uh, is currently run out of our New Haven, Connecticut office. All three of these services are supported by uh, and really held up by our software team, our chemistry team, and our uh, extensive image analysis team. Of course, today we're focusing primarily on the software efforts, uh, which the reason I like to talk about the the services is because the software team really ha is able to take advantage of leveraging the expertise of those other divisions when we build new software. So you'll see as I go through the features and changes in 3.5, many changes have been uh, driven by requests from our own team as well as from requests uh, from our incredible user base uh, such as those out there on the call right now. The software team in particular, uh, we have over nine years of experience now designing, implementing, and maintaining software. The team itself is incredibly diverse. We're, uh, it's a great team to work with. I am excited every day that I get to work with this fantastic team of, of developers, um, engineers, uh, folks with expertise in image analysis, um, mathematics, you name it. Uh, we take on a variety of projects. Uh, obviously, we offer our out-of-the-box software solutions, which include image analysis, data storage, management, uh, GXP-level compliant archiving, uh, preclinical through clinical efforts and then as many of you know we also offer software as a service uh, solutions through our professional services team uh, taking on script writing, custom development, um, specialized tool development uh, for of course both pharmaceutical and academic groups who are looking to use imaging to to drive their their drug research. Currently, we're used by over 182 laboratories worldwide, uh, as well, including over 70% of the top pharma. That includes both the software platforms, VivoQuant, which obviously we're here to talk about today, and IPAX, which is the data management and storage tool that I think many of you are familiar with. So enough about that. Uh, let's talk about VivoQuant 3.5. So really exciting. Uh, VivoQuant continues to grow, become more user-friendly, add to its capabilities, uh, and in my opinion, just greatly improve um, release over release. First, uh, I'm going to mention the multi-view tool. Uh, many of you are aware that we have the multi-view tool. Uh, last release, uh, version 3.0, we uh, 
showed a whole new uh, version of the tool, uh, extending the previous tool to now have a flexible uh, five by five array of viewports um, where in any of those viewports you can display up to three images overlaid at a time. So we've simply built on top of that in 3.5, now being able to combine viewports like you can see in the image on the screen right now, uh, zooming in on selected viewports and then returning to the full view. So if you, there's something in particular you want to really get up, uh, get up close with and then back back out. Also added the ability to save hanging protocols. So for instance, the outline on the screen right now, uh, I've saved and I'll be able to show you later on, pull it up exactly how you see it, replicate it. Uh, great for scripting, storing uh, images in batch, things like that. Also in the multi-view, uh, this release, we've added some more operators. So in the past, the multi-view was just for viewing data. That's no longer the case. Now we can also uh, use the filtering tool, the distance and annotation tool, uh, the arithmetics tool, and the modeling tool, all without having to leave that multi-view. So really just made this tool much more uh, powerful and just another option for you as you're working with data and working with how you want to view your data, how you want to analyze it. Next tool that we've worked on a lot this, this release cycle is the reorientation and registration operator. Um, Many of you are familiar with this tool, very important in the pre-processing uh, workflow. Uh, we've made a few pretty significant changes. First, uh, we've changed our approach to fixed and moving data. So in the past, when doing automatic registration, you could register data, input data, so input one, input two, to the reference, being generally a CT or an MR. Uh, what we found is that the reference isn't always the data set you want to use. And rather than having to move data around, uh, we are now offering the ability to select your fixed data set. So whether that means that you've loaded a CT and an MR and you want to register the pet to one of those, um, or you want to uh, do multiple registration steps if you have some motion that you want to correct for, a lot of options now with this flexibility. Also, we've uh, added landmark-based registration. So leveraging our distance and annotation tool, you can now uh, place landmark points within the image and use those to drive your uh, semi-manual uh, co-registration. And that works uh, both in 2D and 3D, uh, really driven by the, the tissue work that we've been doing here at Invicro in particular with um, our cryofluorescence tomography work as well as our autoradiography work. Another uh, incredibly important tool in the software, the 3D ROI tool. Uh, the big, big thing here um, really started outside the 3D ROI tool and we brought it into the 3D ROI tool is bed removal. Uh, a lot of users have asked for improvements on our bed removal tool uh, for the last couple of years. Historically we did have a very fixed bed removal tool, but now we've added a lot of capability for you as a user to drive your own bed removal template. So the user can now provide an ROI of what the bed will look like in one data set, assuming they use a similar bed across data sets, and apply that ROI for subsequent uh, bed removal in other data sets down the road. And of course, I'll go through all of this uh, in the live demo as well. Also. Um, Always in VivoQuant, we're looking to add more functionality to our VivoScript language. Uh, and the 3 ri tool was an area that we did that uh, this time around, adding some VivoScript functions to uh, streamline histogram analysis of individual ROIs. Finally, uh, two pieces of uh, improvements here. The corner information, some of you might be familiar in previous versions of VivoQuant, you could view the patient's name just embedded right on the image. We thought that wasn't quite enough. You know, we always like to provide as many options as possible. So you now have access to 31 different uh, bits of information, data points, if you will, from palette information to instance number to repetition time, all displayed right on the screen and flexibility in terms of how you want to present that. Uh, there are presets, basic and advanced. Uh, but that's fully flexible and you can adjust that however you see fit. And of course, 
that could even include turning it off. And finally, um, something no one really likes to talk about, but you know, audit logging um, and validation work. So in VQ 3.5, we've now increased the amount of logging that we do of adjustments to image data. This is something we've been doing for a long time and simply expanded it. Uh, now making sure to track if an image is resampled upon loading, uh, if we cut data using the cut ROI feature, uh, and also if we increase the size of an image using the embed feature in the cropping operator. Great, so with that, I'm going to jump into a demonstration of VivaQuant 3.5. Um, I'm going to go through three different workflows, one using a focused brain MR, CT, and spec, one looking at a white light and fluorescence image, uh, and then the final one looking at some uh, PET CT with a bed that we're going to remove. So starting out with that brain example, opening up some Brooker data, using our uh, dedicated Brooker loader that's in VivaQuant. Many of you already are familiar with this. As you know, we strive to be able to support as many data types as possible, really maintaining that agnostic approach to image data. So here we've loaded some data. You can see I've, I have my corner information turned on. So uh, I was using that advanced setting. You can see there's a lot of information here, patient's name, patient's ID, uh, the voxel size, the slice thickness, what slice I'm on, 48 out of 95. This is the coronal view, sagittal, transverse, what position I'm at, X64, Y60, Z48 all of these things just showing up on the screen to make your life easier um, as you need more information or less information to work with the data. To edit how this information looks or what information we present, we go to Tools, Configuration, and then under the Display tab, we go to Corner Info. And that brings up this uh, user interface here that allows you to choose what parameters to display or not display. So for instance, if I am not interested in displaying the palette information or the uh, window preset name, I can just take those out. And then when I say OK, those are now no longer displayed here in my viewports. As I mentioned, we also have some default settings. So the advanced was what I was looking at before. We can go basic, kind of trim that information down a little bit an only view, again, a smaller subset of that information. Of course, you can turn this off completely under view and just turn off that corner information altogether. With this MR data, uh, I'm also going to now append some uh, spec CT. So I'm going to have some, I'm going to load some uh, local DICOM data here from a local DICOM uh, repository. Spec CT data, uh, this is all RAT data. Here I'm just going to append uh, a few frames of the Spec CT data set. As that loads, you'll see that it is uh, resampling to match the uh, voxel resolution of the MR. Um, so as I mentioned, that's something that will get now shown in the audit log uh, as we move along. But We'll, we'll do some other pre-processing before we get there. So first thing we would probably want to do now with this data would be to co-register all in the same space, right? We have the MR, the CT, and the PET, and all, or excuse me, the SPEC, and all three of them are in a different space. And we really want to co-register them before we can do any downstream analysis. So we can do that in the reorientation tool. We'll start by registering the MR to the CT, and we'll do that with a manual approach. First, just flipping the MR data set as it's currently loaded upside down, and then take advantage of 
the manual reorientation tools here in the reorientation, or excuse me, the manual tools here in the reorientation operator. One thing you may not know as I'm going through this is that uh, I think either la either 3.0 or 2.5, we added the ability to, if you hold control, you can click and drag and move data in the reorientation operator. So really a way to very quickly co-register your data. Looks pretty good. Click the check to apply it. And now we'll register the spec to the CT. Now in the past, we would have to reorder the data here in the, um, in the data manager. You know, we would need the CT to be in the reference position in order to register the spec to the CT. That's no longer the case. That said, we did make it a little bit easier to move data around. So um, many of you had complained before if you wanted to reorder data in the data manager, right click, you could, you'd have to swap data uh, with, the, with the other input location. Now you also have the ability to move. So if you have a CT, say, down here at the bottom, and you want to move it up into that input one location, simply right click, move to input one, and it doesn't mess up the order of your other frames. Uh, this is incredibly important working with dynamic data, dynamic PET, um, fMRI, things like that. Performing an automatic co-registration now, like I mentioned, we can select the CT as our fixed location and our moving data set that we'll use to calculate the reorientation matrix. Uh, we now previously could only choose input one. We now can choose from any of the inputs. So for instance, here we'll go with um, this particular spec data set and then we'll be able to apply that co-registration to all the other spec data sets. Now, had we selected multiple moving data sets, uh, that would be similar to what we previously called input all or re uh, register all to ref. So it will perform each co-registration and apply it automatically uh, rather than having to approve each one individually. Uh, if you only select one in the moving data set, then that one is then can then be applied to as many frames uh, that are loaded as you would like. Here, this is nothing new. This is the same automatic uh, co-registration uh, window that you're used to, um, simply using a mass mutual information algorithm to align the moving data set to the fixed data set as best it can. Uh, and here, we can stop it and select which data sets we want to apply that to. And you can see it does a pretty nice job of co-registering that spec to the CT and therefore to the MR, which has already been registered. We click the check to apply. And now everything is co-registered into the same space. One last pre-processing item that we might want to take advantage of with data like these would be cropping. Obviously, we have a lot of extra space in this image that we don't care about. So let's jump into the cropping tool. And here, very simple tool. Um, simply grab the edges of the image, these red lines that surround the data set, and align them around the area that you wish to crop. And when I click the check, it applies that crop. Now I have my data cropped, co-registered. Maybe the next thing I want to do is save an image. So that's where I would use that multi-view. So here we have a lot of different data sets that we're looking at, right? We have the CT, we have the MR, we have the SPECT. We want to be able to look at all of that at the same time. To do that, we can move data into these various viewports, set up, say, maybe we want to do, instead of a one by three layout, we want to add a row, do a two by three layout. We can drag and drop data directly into any of these viewports, let's adjust our min-max a little bit here. There we go. Or we can take advantage of saved protocols. So here's that protocol that I promised before. Data is all nicely organized now. Um, we can see the co-registration of the MR with the CT in the sagittal, the spec with the CT in the coronal and the MR 
and then smaller viewports here on the right. If we wanted to combine some of those viewports on the right, we could do that as well. Merge those. Split them back to the way they were before. We can also zoom in on a specific data uh, viewport. If we really want to get a full view, say, of the CT and MR, we can right-click, full view. Now we can see everything here. We can even zoom in further using shift plus our control or our uh, scroll wheel. Reset that view. And then we can close full view and go back to the way that we were viewing data before. As I mentioned here, we also now have access to the distance annotation tool so we can make measurements the arithmetics tool for performing any math on the images, filtering if there's any smoothing or bias field correction or anything like that you wish to apply, and the modeling operator, uh, which we're not going to talk too much about today, but is a uh, active area of development for us and one that we've been working on a lot uh, over the past couple years, including adding some additional models. Of course, with any uh, view or tool in the software, you can always take images. So here, for instance, is a really nice view of a variety of ways of looking at the same data. Be a good opportunity then to save an image. As you know, that image will save with exactly the same uh, views that you see on the screen. So the crosshair that we have turned on will remain turned on. The information we have in the corners of the image will remain in the corners of the image. So all of that now is saved to a local location. I can pull that up. And that's a presentation ready image, including the distribution of signal. Of course, we could draw regions of interest, perform quantification, things like that. Um, but in the interest of time, uh, let's move on to a different uh, data type. So next, what we'll look at is a white light data set and a fluorescence image um, and take a look at some of the work that we've been doing in the co-registration space there leveraging some landmark based registration so here let's open our white light data set first so here we have our RGB data set um, two animals in a single block obviously we have some fiducials here and then we can append some GFP data, change that color palette, make it pop a little bit. And you'll notice these data sets are not well aligned. Um, certainly, we could perform co-registration using the reorientation tool with a drag and drop approach, maybe an automated registration approach. Um, but for today, let's use a landmark-based approach. So we go to the reorientation tool into our landmark registration option and it tells us that we need to add landmarks. So we click Add Landmark. This is going to bring us into our distance annotation tool. Here what we would do is simply uh, select points in the two images that correlate to one another. So for instance, we can see in my GFP data, this point here correlating to this point in my white light and as I toggle back and forth between them you can you can see that correlation now in the interest of time I do actually already have a have some more uh, selections made um, and then from here we can take these go back into the reorientation tool and it will align those circles um, sort of averaging the transforms between them to co-register our data this is incredibly useful, as I mentioned, for um, autoradiography or our cryofluorescence tomography data. We use a similar approach for rebuilding a 3D volume of 2D slices, which is the approach that we take for our 3D autoradiography and 3D cryofluorescence tomography analysis. So here we specify which reference landmarks or which landmarks are the reference and which ones are moving. Uh, same idea as with the um, automated reorientation tool. So here the reference landmarks are going to, or the moving landmarks are going to be 0, 2, and 4. 
with the reference landmarks being 1, 3, and 5. And when we click register, oops, I'm sorry, I flipped to those, my, my mistake. Let's uh, to do that the right way this time. There we go. Now when we click register, we can see those two data sets are now much more well aligned with one another. And clicking the check will apply that co-registration to my uh, GFP data. From here again, just like I showed with the uh, brain example, we could then take images, uh, we could perform quantification in the 3D ROI tool, uh, whatever is necessary for your analysis. Um, so all of these so far have really just been pre-processing steps that we can take advantage of um, to then build into your downstream analysis. Of course, we can also save these data. So now that we've registered this GFP to the white light, it would probably uh, make sense to save this data. Again, we can save as a variety of formats, uh, as you know. So here, let's just save it as raw, GFP registered, and that will save uh, as a MHD file, which includes some header information and a JPEG. The final uh, workflow that I wanted to go through, um, the one that will take the most time, uh, but I think is most useful for the group uh, on the call, is the new bed removal and uh, 3D ROI tool improvements that we've made, as well as taking a look at the new uh, MIP options that we've added with 3.5, building on some changes we made in 3.0. So let's clear out our distance annotation tool and load up some new data. So here we'll first load a CT data set. So the idea with the bed removal, and I'll go through the full workflow, uh, is to use example data that you already have. Um, maybe that's a CT of a blank bed with no animals in it. Maybe it's a full uh, data set, it doesn't matter. What's important is that we create, is that we generate a segmentation of the bed that you're using. We know every group is using different beds, maybe you're using multiple beds, um, and we want to make it as quick as possible for you to remove those from the image. Obviously that helps with quantification, ROI generation, and of course image generation. So in the 3D ROI tool, uh, here you just need to leverage your same 3D ROI uh, features that you would use for any segmentation, whether that's thresholding, manual segmentation, um, taking advantage of the spline tool, it doesn't matter. Um, what's important is getting an ROI. So conveniently, I already have one uh, ready to go for this data set. And then with this, we add it to our, uh, let's just edit the name of that here. What we do is click this button right here, and that will add this bed and data set to the library that you can then select from when doing uh, subsequent bed removals downstream. So if I click here, it tells us that that bed has been generated. Now when I load a new data set, so let's unload these. and open here animal 2, uh, pet and CT. Here we have a bed that we're going to want to remove. So we go advanced modules, bed removal, advanced. Here we select which data set the bed exists in that we want to remove, and that can be both if necessary. Here we're only going to cut the CT data as we don't want to throw out any of our pet. We have similar selection options for the transform and quality as we do in the reorientation tool. So I'm going to do a rigid transform of my bed to this bed and we'll just use the standard quality. And we have the option now to preview what that will look like, so let's do that. So what's happening now is it's co-registering 
the data that I just added to the data that I have currently loaded. And you know what? Let's use the other bed instead. As I saw that I had a few extra voxels segmented there. Okay, that's better. I can use the reorientation tool to make any adjustments that I want. So for instance, if I wanted to translate that segmentation or rotate it, I could do that. In this case, I don't. I think it looks good. I'm going to confirm it and process. So that's going to cut the bed or cut the voxels from the bed and map them all to negative 1,000. And that's only within the CT. So in our pet, we didn't actually touch that data whatsoever. And now we have, we can get rid of that. We don't need it anymore. And we have our bed removed. The pet hasn't been touched. And we have a much nicer view of the data. Also in the MIP controller, uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to show that we've added some additional features here to give you some more control over how that MIP looks, um, including the histogram, which some of you are used to from 3.0 being able to adjust what voxel values are being shown uh, within the MIP, but also being able to adjust the uh, alpha blending of multiple uh, inputs. So as I decrease the amount of, or increase the transparency in one, vo in one volume, it does the opposite in the other. So I can go back and forth that way. Also, I can adjust my rendering mode right here. Some of you have had some issues with that in the past, so easy to change that now right in the MIP controller. And most importantly, being able to save these settings, so being able to store and load these settings uh, for the MIP so that if you have a set of settings that you like to use, you can use that every time without having to go through the hassle of redesigning how you want that to look. And of course, we can still save movies and save images of this MIP as we go along. So once we've finished our pre-processing, maybe saved some images, of course the last thing we would want to do would be to perform some quantification. So what I'll do is go through a uh, quick demonstration with a uh, segmentation of the skeleton and the gallbladder. In this data set, the gallbladder is uh, pretty bright, so it makes sense. And then we can look at uh, image generation and histogram options from a VivoScript perspective. So some of you may have seen on our blog, which I definitely recommend taking a look at, a similar workflow to this where we can leverage Atsu thresholding to segment the entire animal from the image, uh, leveraging Atsu's threshold. So we'll start there, looking at the reference data set, so the CT, and getting the whole animal. And then repeating that process again, looking at just what's within that whole body and pulling out the brighter voxels, so in this case, the skeleton. If you're not familiar with the workflow I just used, uh, I definitely recommend taking a look at our blog. That's blog.invicor.com. Uh, that workflow is outlined there, including both manual and automated approaches to doing that. We don't need that anymore. The last, the uh, other segmentation that I like to show uh, that is incredibly useful, I think, is the ability to do some threshold-based segmentation, in this case of the gallbladder. Uh, one thing that's important to note here also is that while my skeleton ROI was based on the CT and my gallbladder ROI is going to be based on the PET, that's okay. We can switch back and forth. What matters in the end is that you have voxels that are segmented that you're comfortable with that work for both. And that's why we go through the whole uh, effort of co-registering the data. So here, let's set a threshold for that gallbladder and apply it. Great, so now we have nice segmentations of both the gallbladder and the skeleton. As you know, we can save these ROIs. If they were from an IPAX, we could save them to the IPAX. If we're saving locally, we can do that. And of course, also pull up um, quantification information here. If I click show table, it will give me information like the volume, um, total activity, mean activity, min activity, 
standard deviation of the activity, et cetera, within each ROI, within each loaded image. I can also pull up a histogram of that same information. So for, for instance, in the pet, if I were interested in the distribution of signal in the skeleton, and let's bring that max way down. We can do that really easily. The, this tool, not new, however, um, I think it was one that people uh, or users weren't taking advantage of. Uh, and so one way we thought would be good for that would be also to be able to script this. Um, so that's what we've done. Um, and so what I'll do now is just demonstrate a quick script uh, here in my quick scripts dropdown that will generate images as well as histograms for each of these data sets. So let's get that running. So what this is going to do is give me an image at the center of mass of each of the uh, ROIs as well as print the histogram of each ROI in the pet uh, to both a image, so the a image of that histogram as well as a spreadsheet. So let's pull up how that came out. So in a matter of seconds now I have all of this nice information that I can use for QC. So images, histograms, all saved to my computer. And if you're using an IPAX, you can also upload those files directly to that to the IPAX and associate those images with a given data set, taking advantage of some of our reporting and data point tools. And with that, uh, that's really the end of the live demonstration of the software. Uh, one last thing would be where to find us. So we will be at uh, WMIC next week in Philadelphia booth 403, please stop by and say hi. Otherwise, of course, always stop by our website in www.nvker.com or check us out on our YouTube page or our blog, blog.nvker.com, uh, where this, web this webinar will also be posted. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at support at Thank you all very much for joining, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.